Good morning, Grant. Morning. How are you? Good. I'm Sarah Posner, Senior Editor at Religion Dispatches, and I'm here today with Grant Galicho, who's Associate Editor at Commonweal Magazine. And we are going to talk about the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops uh, and their Religious Liberty Campaign, along with uh, the Vatican crackdown on the religious order of uh, nuns in the United States. Uh, I'll just sort of backtrack a little bit and le give a l little background on all of these sort of intersecting campaigns and events that have been going on uh, within the leadership of the Catholic Church in the United States. Last year, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops launched a religious liberty campaign and formed an ad hoc committee on religious liberty, which has put out statements, testified before Congress, led the charge against the Department of Health and Human Services contraception mandate, um, and most recently issued a kind of call to action over the summer uh, for Catholics to rise up and protest these alleged infringements of religious liberty uh, by the government and by our culture. And somewhat simultaneously with this was this announced crackdown on the Leadership Conference of Women Religious, which is somewhat of a continuation of of an investigation that was already in place. Maybe you can give us a little bit more detail on how all of that came about and what what prompted it. Sure. Um, in 2008, uh, it was announced that the Vatican was going to conduct two investigations. So one of those investigations was going to look at the quote unquote quality of life of nuns in this one particular body of, uh, the, of um, it's like a, it's this umbrella group that covers about 90% of U.S. nuns called the Leadership Conference of Women Religious. It just rolls off the top. Uh, so, they, <laughs> so they decided that they were going to um, send Vatican representatives uh, and working in concert with, with U.S. bishops um, and in concert with the uh, LCWR to investigate what life like a nun in the, in the United States is. So at the same time, uh, the, the Vatican announced that they would be looking at the, um, the doctrine that uh, the, 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 these issues of, of, of beliefs um, as practiced by these orders of nuns. So that's actually a separate investigation. So what's been decided now um, is the end result of the doctrinal investigation. Okay. The study of their quality of life is forthcoming. It's it's referred to in the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faiths report, and that's the Vatican office. That's right, and that's the Vatican office that Pope Benedict, back when he was Cardinal Ratzinger, had headed up. Right. It used to be the office of the Inquisition. Right. This is a, a cuddlier version of that. There can be a cuddlier version of the Inquisition. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is you know the, these this is the. Um, you know the doctrinal watchdog office, basically. So right. This is this is the same office that um, has produced reports looking at theologians, um, uh, liberation theologians, especially um, mm -hmm. priests mainly, uh, and 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 so they so 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 this doctrinal element is being handled by the CDF. So, you know, one of the phrases that popped out of the report that came out last week or uh, it, it's it would be called a report the one that came out of the CDF right. um, was this concern uh, that the Vatican was expressing about the nuns embrace of what they called radical feminism what's I mean is what's going on here this is just basically, yeah, this is. Is a, there something more political going on here in addition well, political, to I don't something know. I mean, within the, Catholicism? The, 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 there's certainly. I mean, you know, there's no mystery that the church, that the institutional church, the leadership of the of the the church, um, has a serious problem when it comes to 
women in leadership roles. I mean, that's, yeah. it's not, well, not and, and, that's, and that's even separate from the question of whether the, the, the institutional church um, believes that it can ordain women. It believes that it cannot. That, right. Uh, right. And so the nuns are not considered clergy. No, they're, uh, they're, they're actually lay women, um, who right. have, who have, um, made certain promises of celibacy and poverty, um, and obedience to their religious superiors. Um, so, uh, you know, the, this is, um, this is an ongoing issue inside, inside the church, the way that the institutional church has responded to advancements in, in our, in the, in, you know, Western societies, especially understanding of women and women's rights and their faculties, et cetera. I mean, if you look at the old Catholic encyclopedia, the entry on, on women, uh, this is the, the 1917 edition is pretty retrograde. I mean, it talks about women as submissive to, you know, the will of their husbands, et cetera, and all, all that kind of, uh, that way of thinking about women considered that we would consider totally outmoded. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the, this doctrinal investigation found, and it, it looked at all kinds of things. It looked at, at publications that the individual religious orders use um, to educate their postulants. It looked at speeches given at conferences. Um, it looked at handouts. It looked at you know. It look, so it looked at a whole range of things. A lot of which is available on online actually. Uh, and it concluded two things. One was that there was a there was a problem of positive error. So, and this is where the radical feminism comes in. Uh, okay. The so they, they these investigators found that there um, there was an undue emphasis on uh, feminism at the exclusion of certain traditional understandings of, of God, of clergy, of tradition, et cetera, et cetera. This is something that also came out um, uh, a few months ago when uh, the U.S. bishops launched a critique of, a, of, of, of Beth Johnson's work. Beth Johnson is a theologian who works at Fordham. She's a, she's a sister of St. Joseph. Um, and what came out in their critique of, of her book was... Um, it was actually quite dramatic, but one of the areas that they focused on was her feminist theology. And they very tendentiously argued that she, that she was arguing that she was pressing for feminine images of God at the exclusion of masculine images, uh, which is simply false. What are the consequences of this report for the lives of these nuns. Yeah. Uh, Are they a, going to be subject to... a big unknown right now. So, they, okay. so uh, Rome has appointed the, the Archbishop of Seattle. Um, I believe his name is pronounced Seton, uh, but I, I could have that wrong, uh, who has a reputation for being uh, pretty moderate. And so he has been appointed this delegate, this apostolic delegate. And he has a pre pretty wide-ranging authority. Uh, he... According to this report from the CDF, he has the authority to rewrite the statutes that sort of the bylaws of, of the uh, LCWR. Um, I'm not sure if he also has the authority to go into the individual religious orders, religious communities, and, and you know restructure their organization. I'm not sure about that. Um, he could, he has the authority to approve. Uh, speakers that are invited to conferences, he can. Um, there, there's a there's a training book that is pulled out of circulation as a result of this report, and he's going to be able to edit it, rewrite it. Um, and a training booklet, training for what? Training postulants. You know, this is the, mm -hmm. the spirituality courses. Uh, right. That that you know, this is the, how um, members of community f form themselves. Mm -hmm. That's the way Catholics put it. So he, you know, he has, and it, it's interesting that there was like, there was a cover letter that the guy who runs the CDF, um, Cardinal Leveda, he put out this statement, um, for a one page statement, uh, but he, he, he kept emphasizing that this was a collaboration. Um, so you can tell, and the fact that I, that, the, that Rome appointed a bishop who has a reputation as pretty moderate, I think says some, says that they understand that this is not uh, going to go over that, that well with these women religious. Right. Or with rank and file Catholics. Yes. 
Um, yeah, I mean, there's a, yeah, there's a, there's a Twitter campaign right now. I forget what the hashtag is, but it's sort of like, there are a couple of Twitter campaigns. There's one, I think that was started by father James Martin. And I can't remember what the hashtag is. There's another one. The hashtag is radical feminist themes, I think, Mm. which was started by, um, I think it was started by Occupy Catholics. Is that right? Um, yeah, so it's basically, yes. you know, people, people like me. Not that, not that Twitter is the sum total of, Catholics on Twitter is not the sum total of what Catholics no, in America but think. This isn't, <laughs> you know, right, no, but this isn't five years ago either. I mean, you're seeing it on right, Facebook, right. too. It's, it's, it's very mainstream, and I think most Catholics um, who spent time in, in, in religious education have, you know, had had contact with nuns. You know, these are, these are the women. Right, of course. Like people like me, um, I, I'm, I'm a Chicago guy, so... The Catholic Church there um, still had a very it's it's not as robust as it is as as it, as it was. But when I was a kid, we I had nuns. Um, right. They were not habited, um, uh, which you know I I'm, I'm a Vatican II kid, so uh, mm-hmm. I didn't think twice about it. Um, right. But so yeah, we all have relatively positive experiences with these women, and well, and and even even if you want a discount for the you know the the. The, the tales of, you know, rulers being used in, in ways they weren't designed for. Uh, there, the, there's still just the fact of what these women do. Right. They have well, taken vows of poverty. They have agreed not to marry. They, they live in community. They, 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 they are the ones who built the Catholic infrastructure in this country. I mean, without them, there would be no Catholic schools. Without them, there'd be no Catholic hospitals. So, you know, that, that this is a point that's been made by other people, including um, Scott Appleby, who's a Notre Dame. I was about historian. to bring that up because you, I have seen that you posted that video on your on right. your blog. Uh, I mean, he, he, he makes he, a very he compelling it argument. As, I mean, it, these, yeah, it's not that. But he described it as inappropriate and humiliating. He did that and, the Vatican would investigate right. and, the Nazis. And he, this way. he makes the point, uh, which is persuasive, that the way that this document has come down from the CDF, it treats these women as though they're school children. Um, well, that's the and, idea, I mean, right? I mean, these, <laughs> are, these are, these are women who democratically elect their own leadership, uh, much like the way the Pope is democratically elected bishops, not so much, but, but leadership of uh, religious congregations and the Pope there, there's some democracy there. And so even though these women have voted for their leadership, they now have someone who's being installed, by the, by the outside, being installed by Rome, who will have pretty sweeping authority over the very constitutions of their organizations. That's, you know, that's, so that's why Appleby, I think, rightly calls it humiliating. Right. Well, on a, to look at it a different way, Sister Simone Campbell, who works with this organization network, told, I think, the Washington Post or USA Today, she said, I think we scare them. Right. So that's kind of another way of looking at it, that they're a threat to the Catholic hierarchy in some way, either yeah, I mean, I, doctrinally I or think I, I, there's a, there's a, politically. There, there, there's a point in the, um, in the, the uh, Vatican document where um, the, the, the LCWR is criticized for failing to agree with bishops on, on matters of it's i forget what the wording is it's like the, it's like on matters of morals you know faith and morals which is you know the, the bishop's teaching arena um mm-hmm. but it's also on on bishop's public positions and th- that's the word that appears in the cdf document i immediately thought of the, the health care debate sure um and the way that the catholic health association um which is run by sister Twice. carol kean publicly opposed, Twice. and not in any kind of aggressive way but they yeah. simply stated that when it, and th- this happened during the healthcare debate too, that their well, this is, their public policy interpretation or their interpretation of the way the law was 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 written did not conform to USCCB statements. Right. And well, let's 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 yeah. re revisit that just because the, I think the details are somewhat important in because back when the what became the Affordable Care Act was being debated in Congress. There was the notorious Stupak Amendment, which was designed to prevent the use of any federal funds going to pay for anyone's abortion, even though the Hyde Amendment already 
prohibits right. that. Elected and abortions, there was a, yeah. Right. And there was already um, an amendment drafted by Congresswoman Lois Capps that sort of reiterated that for the purposes of the health care reform, you know, the health care reform bill. Uh, but the Stupak Amendment went further in terms of uh, wanting to ban the the, um, the use of the the participation in the exchange by by uh, insurance companies that offered abortion otherwise, right. even though they didn't offer coverage to the people participating in the exchange. Uh, so, and so eventually, what happened when the bill hit? The Senate, there was sort of a, a somewhat watered down version of the Stupak Amendment that got put in and eventually was part of the final bill uh, because it was part of the final bill in part, in large part, because the Catholic Health Association said, yes, that's fine. It's okay. We're fine with that. We're fine with the, uh, whoever it was, uh, uh, Nelson and Casey Amendment. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the, but the bishops continued to oppose it. But the fact that the Catholic Health Association gave cover, essentially gave political cover, their approval gave political cover to the Democrats. Right. That they, they could say, look, the Catholic Health Association says this is okay, that there's no federal funding for abortion in this bill, and we really want to get health care reform passed, and, and Sister Kian is, you know, saying this is okay. That gave the Democrats a lot of cover. And then another time... You know, after Obama made the accommodation on the uh, contraception coverage requirement this February, just a couple of months ago, again, it was Sister Kean who essentially gave the political cover and said, yes, we're okay with this, even though the bishops continued to fight it and still continue to fight it now. Yeah. And so it's, I can't help, you can't help if you follow politics, oh, no, you can't yeah. help but see no, the connection between... You can, you can between, also see a very similar strategy... Um, from the Bishop's Conference. Uh, one of our bloggers um, you know, noted that during the healthcare debate, when it came to the question of abortion, all of the statements coming out of the USCCB had this kind of worst case scenarioism that was animating all of, all of the opposition I mean, to, 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 to Stupak, even to the executive order that Stupak got the president to sign. There, there were increasingly Baroque, uh, are, these, these these scenarios that that the bishops' conference was was floating that you know even if you um, even if you pro you know kiss my foot no e no erases there's going to be no federal funding of elective abortions even if the president says says that that even just federal credits for um, health plans in the state exchanges right. uh, that that because that could free up cash that a woman might use to pay for an elective abortion, that that, that that was enough to oppose even that executive order that satisfied Stupak, and which eventually cost him his seat. Um, I mean, Stupak felt betrayed. You know, he, he, he wrote about this. He said that he, you know, he felt he, people at the Bishop's Conference stopped returning his calls. Uh, and he went from hero to enemy mm -hmm. uh, of the pro-life movement, um, of, you know, the, 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 the more organized versions, like the NRLC and, and the um, right. American Life right. League, which is relatively new. Uh, so, so, there, so, you, so there's that worst case scenario thinking during the Affordable Care Act, and now what you're seeing uh, in the bishop's response to um, even the accommodation is the same sort of thinking. You know, what if this? You know, I mean, and it's what, what's what's interesting for me is the way that the Obama administration has really responded. So, you know, you've got the first version of the contraception mandate, which Commonweal opposed, which I opposed. Then there was the accommodation, which broke away um, the, the, the funding of, of contraception care and also the direct, um, uh, direct, what's the word I'm looking for? Direct, um, oh, so, so you didn't have to contract for services that would be uh, inimical to your religious belief. So that was, that was completely separated. Um, from health coverage and from the coverage that was being purchased by the employer. That the employer provider, so, the, the, that right. the employer provides to and, the employees, right. And so at every turn, the Bishop's Conference has has interpreted even the accommodation as, you know, you know, the, if, if, if this is going to, if, if you look at the way that, that the, uh, the exemption is, is structured, it's going to, 
you know, permeate all kinds of federal laws. You know, you can't say that just because that, that the only religious employer is the parish and the parish school. That's not how Catholics view their ministries. They view, you know, Catholic hospitals as, as, an, as, as an expression of uh, following Christ's teachings. So that, so that was, that was one of the critiques. So the most recent, um, the most recent thing that came out of HHS, it's in the, the federal uh, registry now, is this... Which is the, the, the proposed rulemaking right. based on the accommodation yeah. that Obama made on, on February 10th. Yeah, so right. I mean, if you can plow through the regulatory language, it's the, it's brutal. But um, it, you can see the Obama administration tying itself in knots, trying to respond to the bishop's concerns. And one of the things that, that this proposed rulemaking states outright is that nothing in the HHS regs can be can be construed as as um, you know being uh, any kind of precedent for other federal laws. This is only about contraception. That that's what right, HHS is saying. Right. But that's still so, still not good enough. So you know you, you mentioned that you opposed the original rule that came out yeah. on January twentieth. And did you think that the accommodation addressed, adequately addressed the concerns, your concerns, if not the bishop's concerns? Yeah. I mean, my, my major concern um, was, from a Catholic moral theological point, point of view was the level of cooperation. That's how Catholics talk about this stuff. So right. if you... So that, you, that, the, that the religious institutions would be somehow involved in providing the coverage for the right. contraception. And so, so, you know, so, so just that this is going to... I don't want to get too deep in, in the weeds on, on, on Catholic stuff, but but you know the 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 Catholic moral tradition is, has shock absorbers, so it doesn't you know it 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 recognizes that our world is not perfect, and then it's 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 damn near you know it's it's, just, it's not really possible to commit morally pure acts that we're always involved in some kind of structural sin. Right. So it developed these. Well, especially being we all pay taxes to the government. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So it's you know and you know the bananas we eat are picked by you know people whose fingers are stunted by that work. So, I mean, it's that, that kind of thinking. So, so the tradition developed these categories where to, in order to help us think through, um, forms of cooperation with evil as, as the, as the, as the Catholic theology holds that, um, that would be acceptable. So, and, so what, what do you think is behind the bishops and the, they did this with, uh, the, Healthcare reform and the abortion coverage, and they're doing it with the contraception coverage. This very sort of hyper technical parsing of the statutory or regulatory language. There's that piece of it, and there's also the piece of it uh, where, like you said, this sort of parade of horribles, this never ending slippery slope that, you know, that this is going to cause this precedent or that precedent or lead to this thing or that thing, um, or, you know, lead to this terrible requirement imposed by the government on religious institutions getting in the way of their ability to just be themselves, be what they're supposed mm -hmm. to be. Uh, yeah, I is mean, this it's a, a game for them? I mean, do you think that this is, that these are, do you think that these are legitimate, uh, genuinely, sincerely believe, genuinely held concerns by the bishops? Or is this a political game that they're playing because on the on the, it's hard to see. I think it's even hard for Catholics to see, as you were just discussing. It's even hard for Catholics to see the value in this, for lack of a better word, nitpicking over this mm -hmm. stuff. Well, I mean, if there's one thing Catholicism is good at, it's nitpicking. But 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 I think what's but I think what's 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 strange, and, I, and you've just gotten at something that's that's that you know boggles my mind is why do we see such careful parsing? Um, such, you know, slippery slope, you know, very, very detail-oriented analysis of the Affordable Care Act statute of, of these regulations coming out of HHS when the Catholic tradition itself provides, uh, you know, pretty robust equipment to help Catholics think through these moralists. But we haven't, and this has been one of, you know, this has been the, the axe that I've been grinding on, on Commonwealth's blog. When are we going to see a Catholic argument from a Catholic bishop about this stuff, and we, we really haven't seen one. We've seen, and which is which is okay. I mean, it, you know, one of the things that the Catholic Church teaches is that it, uh, 
many of its moral teachings or its, its 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 moral teachings are accessible to non-Catholics, you know, through natural law. We haven't we haven't seen a kind of natural law argument, uh, except when it comes to something like you know gay marriage. But um, but but here in, in this particular case, it's I mean I find it very strange, and I don't know. I mean, I, I you know I think if I I think most bishops I, I think they. I think they just want to, you know, do the work of their dioceses. You know, they want to teach, govern, and sanctify in their local diocese. And I don't know, you know, I don't know that most bishops are really interested in getting involved in a national campaign like the one that's being called for by the ad hoc committee on religious freedom. But um, there are bishops who seem very interested in it. Uh, Oh, sure. You've no, 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 seen, of course. I you've mean, seen it's, some it's of a, them talk about it very publicly. You've seen the bishop in Chicago whose name is now... Um, you're thinking of the uh, Peoria is, guy, Bishop Bishop. Jenkins. The Peoria guy, right. The one who compared Obama to Hitler and Stalin. And then you have the Archbishop of Philadelphia talking about how, you know, yes, this religious freedom thing is about to, you know, come down on us in this very terrible, unprecedented way. And um, and then even, even non-bishops... Uh, in Catholic organizations, I'm thinking of the Knights of Columbus speech last week at the National sure. Catholic Prayer, Prayer Breakfast, which, again, uh, portrayed some of these uh, policy uh, events uh, as the most dire threat to sure. religious freedom that we've that we've ever seen. Right, and you could... and I just wonder how does that hyperbole really play with. You're saying that it doesn't even play with their fellow bishops. Well, I mean, I, you know, I'm, 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 I'm just speculating, about, I'm, but I do think, I mean, the, the, the bishops' conference is made up of a lot of different kinds of people. Um, right. And 270-something bishops, right? Something like that? Sorry? 270-something yes. bishops. and that, yes. bishops. And that, that, that includes the auxiliary bishops um, in addition to the bishops and archbishops of various dioceses. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it would be... <laughs> This would never happen, but it would be really interesting to get a poll of the, the bishops to see what they make of this national campaign. You've seen, I think, you've seen the statement, the, the most recent statement out of the ad hoc committee, um, I think, has tried to address some of the more prominent critiques of the original yeah. statement. So, so you see that they're starting to list other impingements on religious freedom. Right, they talk about the immigration the, the immigration statutes, and they single out they, Alabama's. They, right. And they talk yeah, about that uh, crazy Connecticut bill that wasn't going anywhere and didn't go anywhere that would have allowed that would, <laughs> would have, the state basically would have decided how to incorporate and structure individual parishes. That was a direct and response. This, this, to and that that is hardly that that bill that went nowhere in Connecticut is hardly a trend. No, it's not. <laughs> and even even the um, Alabama law, which um, you know, I certainly. I would like to see fail. I'd like to see get overturned by the Supreme Court, which has agreed to hear it. Um, yes, it's but, terrible, but, but, obviously. But, but some of the most objectionable things in that bill were already overturned by by Alabama state court. So, so you, you know, some of the things in, in, the, in the Bishop's most recent, some of the complaints about, you know, the law for, you know, basically criminalizing Catholic ministries, um, it seems to me those have already been addressed. And, and well, and they weren't. They, the, the bishops in their original, the ad hoc committee's original statements and original testimony before Congress, I think it was the House Judiciary Committee last year, and then again, you know, Bishop Lori testified a few times in relation to the contraception mandate. But those original statements did not bring in these concerns about the um, immigration, and I'm pretty sure that they, they didn't even bring in the Hosanna Tabor um, issue into the that discussion. Was a pretty, no, that was a pretty early strategy that, uh, that was they that, identified, yeah. Okay, so but, but but it was, the immigration thing was new, well, and but so I think was, that, like you're saying, and so it was, was the, in direct sorry. the Connecticut thing. It, it was in direct response to criticism that they were only concerned about issues relating to abortion, contraception, right. same-sex marriage. And, and then, the, But there was one other piece that they added in to the most recent statement, which was the, the you know, long-awaited acknowledgement that religious freedom issues in other parts of the world actually result in the deaths of people. <laughs> right. So, you know, that's not what, um, so, and, and this is, this is something that was brought up by the uh, America Magazine editorial that, you know, when you talk about the contraception mandate as though, um, it's the, you know, it's, I think Cardinal Mahoney called, you know, he, he, he said, he wrote that he could, you know, he could think of no more 
dramatic theft of religious freedom. He said something like that. Well, no. Um, you can think of being murdered for your religious belief. I mean, that would be, which actually is happening right now in certain parts of the world. Right. So, I mean, it's, so once it's, it's good to see that, you know, this ad hoc committee is at least responding to some of the, some of the critiques um, that have been made. By, but still, by even though they the did, system. even though they did, they still, you know, to even, to even bring up, uh, you know, Reformation era hostility to Catholics and, you know, and, and to compare it to the martyrs and saints. It's just, the hyperbole is just, I, I have a hard time understanding why that sort of hyperbole is okay, yet this alleged, you know, radical feminism, woo, by the nuns is somehow the reason to investigate them and crack down on them and have this whole doc doctrinal uh, uh, crackdown on, 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 on the nuns. It's, it's, it's so, to an outsider, and I'm not Catholic, obviously, but to an outsider, it just seems so, out of, everything is out of proportion uh, in terms of their rhetoric on the religious freedom thing, and then on the flip side of that, their rhetoric about what's allegedly wrong with the nuns is also um, on the on the hyperbolic end of things. Well, although I will, I would, I mean, the, the CDF statement is much more careful, actually. Um, e even if you don't agree with the, the radical feminism right. critique, okay. it does spend time lauding nuns for for the work that, that they've you know quoting John Paul II who who wrote some mm -hmm. very um, beautiful compliments I mean and, and it's it's you know and it's it shows a little bit I think a little more careful uh, thinking in terms of optics although the timing of it is not great I mean it's like right I mean that was that was I think what struck me because I've been covering the religious freedom campaign and the HHS mandate and all of that and the timing just seems so shockingly right. toned up. Well, um, if they were yeah, going to do something I mean, this like is this not, at all, this is not Rome's gift, and and the Vatican, <laughs> you know, the Vatican operates on its own schedule, um, and this is something, right. yeah, this is something that's been in the works for a long time. It's you know, th there could be any number of reasons that they ran this out now. Um, you know, maybe. Uh, I mean, there could be, there could have been like an opening in, in someone's schedule. It, it's, you know, who, there's, there are a lot of moving parts in, in Rome. So it's, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't look at it as a coordinated effort. Um, no, but, but, but if you're thinking uh, sort of strategically right. in terms of your the public perception right. of what you're doing, it didn't seem well-timed. No, but, and, and so you've got, I mean, you've got the bishops in the United States um, making a strong argument that anybody, any private employer... Um, should be able to give people free tacos. Wait, no, that wasn't it. What was it? it was, oh, sorry. It was any Taco Bell owner could decide not to, you know, give an employee contraception coverage. Um, right. That obviously makes it look like the bishops are are pushing to to make it, you know, difficult for women to get contraception. And then, and then at the same time, you've got well, they are right. <laughs> well, although uh, finally this may backfire. I mean, I, I, they've actually ended up. Um, giving the Democrats a pretty good fun fundraising tool. Well, yeah, definitely. But even setting aside electoral politics, how is this how is this being received by Catholics? I mean, I know you posted the Appleby, uh, is that his name? The Notre Dame professor, yeah, um, the, that interview. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I just in casual conversation with Catholics that I know, uh, I, I meet people who are just, you know, just fed up with the bishops trying to impose these beliefs and this doctrine and this, this orthodoxy on their parish or sure. on them. Although, yeah, you know, teaching orthodoxy is kind of their job. But I'm, but it's an open question. Right, but in a, in, a, but it, in a more in a broader political arena, imposing that orthodoxy and bringing politics into the parish. Well, and that's I mean that's that's where the bishops need to tread very lightly because, that you know, Catholics do not respond well to being told how to vote by their pastors. That is just not how it's done. There's no mm -hmm. in in the United States. There's not a long tradition of having politicians speak from the pulpit. So anytime you see, and I've seen it in, in, in my own parish, um, mm -hmm. 
you know, when my pastor read the statement from the Bishop of Brooklyn uh, about the HHS mandate, which was actually different from uh, a, a lot of the other statements that, that bishops put out. Um, you could sort of, I was looking around the, the church and you could kind of see, this came after, you know, at the end of mass. And so you could see people kind of, you know, their back backs were straightening. They were looking around, you know, trying to see what other people were making of this because it's very unusual. So, you know, when you, when you note that you're, you know, you're getting this specific policy complaint uh, after mass at church before, mm -hmm. you know, before mass is over. And then you see this, you know, fortnight for freedom that mm -hmm. the ad hoc committee on religious freedom is, is planning. You know, I, I just, I'm very dubious that this is going to go over at the parish level. Yeah. But what's the, what would be the repercussions? I mean, if it doesn't go over at the parish level, what do, what do mm -hmm. the, what do the parishioners do? Do they go to their priests and say, I'm not that excited about hearing about oh, sure. this at mass? Yeah, I mean, that, you know, pastors are uh, practiced at receiving complaints from parishioners for sure. Uh -huh. uh, but yeah, of course, I mean, that would be some, I mean, you could, I mean, uh, people might just not show up at these Fortnite for, for Freedom events, however they take shape. Um, you know, you could see people you know, voting with their wallets. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's hard to predict. Um, I don't think, you know, I don't think there'll be a mass exodus or anything like that, but, um, and it's also going to be, but, it's, still, it's still up to each individual bishop how hard they push. And I don't think there are a lot of bishops uh, who are going to force their pastors, their, their priests to, to preach on this. Um, I mean, even, this, even that this letter. Fortnight of freedom that, sorry? thing that they're, this fort, fortnight of freedom, that campaign that they're planning for the summer, you mean? Yeah. I mean, you'll mm -hmm. see, yeah, there might be public, I, uh, this could hit with a giant thud. I mean, I, I just don't know that uh, I'm dubious that this is going to be an effective, um, campaign. First of all, mm -hmm. very few people know what the word fortnight is. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's just, uh. Political agitation. And how many people know who Sir Thomas More is? I, I, I just am so well, fascinated. I mean, you know, that they... The way that it's used in that document, you wonder whether the, the bishops do. It's not like he, you know, it's not like right. he, he had a history of, of uh, being a champion of uh, religious freedom. Exactly. See, that's that's what was so amazing to me. And there was an article somewhere, I can't remember where, or maybe it was just a blog post, which actually took this, this Reformation analogy even further. And it, it, engaged in this pretense that there was never any Catholic hostility and persecution of Protestants during right. the Reformation era. It was, it was portrayed entirely as this analogy between the U.S. government of today and right. Henry VIII trying to impose right. the right. Church of England on, on Catholics in England. And it was just like, it was so over the top that you just could not believe how anybody who had any any marginal knowledge of that history would would absorb yeah. that in any in any way yeah it was not you know not the finest example of uh <laughs> the bishop's committee uh bishop committee's knowledge of of religious history but also well, i mean because at that, that time in that... england at at that time in England, people who were distributing English language Bibles were burned at the stake. I mean, so, you know, because the the Vatican didn't like, um, you know, the what was going on with the Protestant Reformation, not just in Germany, but in, in England at the time. So, right, and, and, and this is this is referred to in that in the most recent statement in the in the most hilariously sanitized way. It's like, you know, there. <laughs> You know, there were there have been moments of shadow that have. It's like just, it's like well, I mean, it's not yeah. it's not like it, it, you know, uh, there's a, there's a dark history there. It doesn't mean that the the bishops can't make an argument for religious freedom now, but the kind of argument they're making, um, it's it's perplexing. And so yes. so I mean, do, I don't do I think that the members of the the bishops who are who are on the ad hoc committee are themselves partisans? No. I don't actually. Mm -hmm. um, I think they're being sloppy, and I think they're being sloppy mm -hmm. in a way that allows their authority um, to be misused by political partisans. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't. You know. I mean, uh, sure. Obviously, you know, 
bishops vote. So some of them vote for Republicans, others vote for Democrats, some vote for independents, probably a lot right in. You know, it's not that they're they're apolitical creatures, um, but it's but in this particular instance, the, one of the reasons that Commonweal editorialized in uh, strongly, you know, critiquing the, the bishop's most recent statement was precisely because that the, the, when you make sloppy arguments, when you seem, you know, intent on driving uh, one particular point as hard as you can for as long as you can, and without acknowledging countervailing arguments, countervailing historical facts, you, you look like you're not being fair-minded. Mm -hmm. Well, the other piece of this, to bring it back to the, the crackdown on the women religious, is that they're complaining, the bishops are complaining that their religious liberty is being infringed upon, yet, and I know this is more of an internal Catholic debate as opposed to a government policy that they say is imposing, in, in, infringing on their religious freedom, but they're, they're cracking down on the speech and interpretation and practice of Catholicism by these nuns. Like the nuns do not have any, you looking at it from the outside, sure. it looks like, you know, the nuns don't have any freedom to express their religious beliefs, that they must well, I wouldn't, fall in line. Yeah, I, I wouldn't put it that way. I mean, and also this is, um, you know, for good or for ill, you make a promise of obedience. Um, and so this is part, you know, this is part of the structure. Uh, but it, was there at one time uh, that such dissent and disagreement was more accepted by the Vatican? I mean, because, you know, obviously the current Pope has a reputation for being the enforcer, right? Because he yeah, used to head up the Although I think he CDF. struck a different pose as Pope. As um, Pope. And you see this in, in um, what, what the church calls uh, Episcopal Synod. So when, so Bishop Synod, this was, a, this was something the Vatican II tried to bring back meetings of the world's bishops in Rome, uh, you know, kind of sharing of ideas, um, that sort of thing. Under John Paul II, a lot of bishops complained that it, that it seemed like the agenda and the conclusions were already set before they even met. That mm -hmm. hasn't been the case under Benedict. Oh, uh, there, you know, uh, mm -hmm. Bishops have, have been, you know, very open about the fact that it does seem to be a more a, a more genuine kind of give and give and take. Um, so, f but, for, but it's not, but again, you know, no, no one should be surprised that um, the current Pope, uh, you know, that the people sort of see the way that nuns are being treated now and they say, well, this is, you know, this, this is something that we were afraid of uh, when, when we saw that he was elected. Right. But I think that a lot of the criticism has come uh, a lot of the criticism of the Vatican's crackdown on on the sisters has been these are the like you said at the at the outset that these are the people who you know, built the hospitals and the schools and the social service agencies and and run them and without them where would all of that infrastructure be and where who would be the people who carried on that social justice tradition? Yet there's another way to look at it, which is that you know so why are they there's one way to look at it and say, why are they cracking down on, on these charitable and and selfless people? But there's another way to look at it as, you know, why are why are they so threatened? Is that the would that be the right word? Are they threatened or are they just being hostile to the variety of interpretation of Catholicism and Catholic doctrine that I think the the nuns were probably used to being able to express that at one point in time. I mean, am I wrong about that? I mean, is it is it, it? I'm just trying to get a sense of has this been in the works for a long time? I mean, there's been like feminism and and liberation theology, and I mean, is it has it never been acceptable to the Catholic hierarchy, or uh, is it? becoming less acceptable? Is there sort of a shrinking window of, of where the doctrine can be? Mm. Those are a lot of questions. Um, let me see. Let, let me see if I can take some of them up. I think, um, I think that feminism is 
certainly and has been and continues to be a, a preoccupation of, of certain bishops, uh, certain theologians who are very suspicious of, of feminism to the extent that it is seen as a threat to tradition. Mm. Um, there, when it came to the Beth Johnson case, uh, what I found in, in, in the U.S. Bishop's critiques of her work was a kind of willful misreading, you know, a failure to see that her work was not, was not intended to exclude men, but mainly, but to make more space for women. And so she, she retrieved from, from scripture, you know, these, these feminine images of, of, of God. Um, and it's like, it's, it's like, you know, some, some of these, some of these guys have like an allergic reaction. You know, they see these, fem you know, you, you see someone trying to retrieve these feminine uh, images and suddenly you think, well, you know, you must want to replace men. That's what this is really about, right? Um, and even though Johnson uh, defended herself very admirably um, and very persuasively, you know, there, there was a kind of obstinate uh, attitude from the U.S. Bishops Committee on Doctrine is what, is what produced these critiques that refused to acknowledge um, that, that, that her, her, she didn't see herself as cutting men out of the picture. This was about including women. This was about attending to women's spiritual needs. Um, and, you know, I don't think when you, you know, when you see you know, that, that, that most recent uh, study of uh, millennials showing that even though 80% of them had been raised in a, in a Christian tradition, that um, over a period of time, only 60% of them continued to identify as such. Mm -hmm. You know, that, I think that kind of attrition, um, church leaders, you know, not just Catholic church leaders, but, you know, all, all church leaders, if you, you know, that, that's something that the people should be very scared of. Uh, and it's very hard for me to believe that these kinds of, um, these kinds of signals that get sent, regardless of what the intention is, but the, if, if, if the signal is that um, we bishops are are concerned about um, you know women having access to contraception, and we're concerned that these women religious are too radically feminist. Um, you know how is that heard? I'm just I I, you know, I don't know to what extent bishops are really thinking, but I don't think you know I, I'm not sure most young Catholic women uh, are going to take that well, especially when right. especially when you're seen to be going after um, a group of people who have committed their lives uh, right. to building up the church. Well, I mean, do you think that that is the goal? Is the goal to make the faith more doctrinally pure, so to speak, or what in, in the Vatican's mind would be I mean, more you know, doctrinally pure? And whether, you know, if everyone wants to come along, they can come along. And if they don't like it, they don't have to come along. I mean, do you think... I, I think that's certainly the attitude of some bishops, certainly Catholics, certain Catholics. Um, but it's not like there's a game plan, you know, where we go after the nuns and then we go after the, the liberal lay groups and then, then we go after the liberal... Pay. It's not like that. You've just, mm -hmm. you've, I think, I, to be honest, one, one of the things that, that drove this uh, investigation of, of nuns here in the States was just their dwindling numbers. And that's been something that... Wait, but why would dwindling numbers cause an investigation? Well, the, you would the, think that the, dwindling numbers would make them cherish the dwindling numbers that they had left. Well, yes, and that's certainly... Yeah, that would be one of my responses. But but <laughs> but if you look at the number of nuns, I mean, there's something uh, sixty thousand left, maybe. Um, and, and, and and what's the demographic? The age demographic, right? And that's and they're, trending and they're, old, they're, yes, right? And, and they're actually having trouble paying for. I mean, it's you know, they're they are you know they're they're working as hard as they can with what they have. Well, and, so, but, but, so if you look at it from a, you know, from an outsider's point of view, right? And so, so as a non-Catholic looking in on this, you would think, well, why would the church want to make their lives miserable at this point? What would be the ultimate, like you said, you don't know if they even realize what their end game is, but if you were thinking of an end game, 
why would you why would you go after these dwindling numbers and make it seem less hospitable for younger women who might want to um, take those vows and and have that life? Yeah, I mean, I I can't answer that question, but I mean, I, I do this. I don't know how this is going to play out. I mean, it it, it could be. You know, it could be like the supposed ban on on gay priests that came out five or six years ago when they, there was a document that came out from Rome that seemed to strongly suggest that uh, the church would not ordain gay gay men. Um, but I don't really know any bishops, or I don't know any Catholics who believe that gay men are really being screened out uh, because there's in a, practice, yeah, in, in in practice, and in in practice, this this. Um, this report could result in, in relatively minor changes. Um, this could be, um, you know, these could, the, the statutes could be edited in such a way that, that, that didn't actually change much about the day-to-day -day lives of nuns. That doesn't, you know, that, that, that doesn't soothe the insult. Um, but it, this, you know, that when, when, when you ask, you know, what, why would you want to make it harder for young women who are considering uh, uh, this this sort of life of service. Uh, I mean, it may, the the practical consequences could be pretty limited, um, but that's something you know we'll just have to see. Who a, there's a lot of unknowns. I mean, that this is a big job. They will have, you know the the bishop who's been put in charge of this has been given the authority to 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 add staff members um, because you know there there are lots of communities of women religious who fall under the LCWR. Right. Well, I guess the other thing that I'm thinking about is my inbox got fairly filled up with press releases from different organizations basically protesting this action by the Vatican. Mm -hmm. um, the Conference on Women's Ordination, um, or I think it's called the Women's Ordination Conference. There were some other groups, and then there's a group, Catholics for Equality, which is a pro-gay pro marriage group. Um, which is starting some kind of uh, social networking campaign um, to support uh, same-sex marriage among Catholics. Um, does this have any impact at all on, I mean, do the, does the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops take these sorts of protests by rank-and-file Catholics into account? Does it matter to them? Or do they're just thinking, mm -hmm. these are these are people on the fringes and we don't need them anyway, or we don't want them? Well, because... I, I seriously doubt uh, whether the support of the Women's Ordination Conference or the support of any pro-gay marriage groups is going to uh, redound to the benefit of the, the sisters who are being investigated. Um, I don't know that it would have. But does it, impact, does it have it, any impact? You know, it's like it's the, the, these are this is this is radioactive stuff when it when it comes to bishops. I, I, I remember when um, now Cardinal Dolan was elected president mm -hmm. of the bishops' conference. That was that was kind of an upset because the tradition of, of the conference had held that whoever was the vice president for the f previous three years would be elected. It was almost like automatic. But right. what happened was that the guy who was vice president, there was a there was a very organized campaign against him. Uh, by conservative Catholics who tried to smear him uh, with this with responsibility in a case of a, of, a, of a sexually abusive priest, it was a it was a bogus campaign. I mean, they, it was it was ridiculous. I I heard that they, these people were calling the hotel rooms of bishops late in that controversy, a, a, maybe a day before the uh, ballots were cast. The Rainbow Sash movement uh, endorsed the bishop. Who had been vice, vice vice president? My immediate reaction was, "This is going to hurt him," because that's going to it's going to make yeah. I mean, it's, I mean it, it was absurd, and and I you know, and of course you know the rainbow the rainbow sash movement sent out a press release as soon as he lost, and and you know asked for donations, and I mean you know so there are like there are some interesting. It's not clear to me that those statements of support help anyone other than the people who are making those statements. But how else do dissenting Catholics have a say? Well, uh, it's, I mean, obviously, in a country like the United States, you can write whatever you want, say whatever you want. You can, you can make your... Right, I mean, I mean within audience. the church, though. I mean, because, you know, there are people who are 
uh, devout Catholics. They want to be Catholic, but they feel like this, the stances of the church on something like same-sex marriage, to just take that as an example, is antithetical to their, mm -hmm. um, their own beliefs. So I'm not talking about in terms of how do they have a say in public life, but how do they, how do they express their concerns or discontent mm -hmm. within their own, within their own church and church broadly as opposed to within their own diocese or parish? Oh, I, that's, you know, that's a question for the ages, Sarah. Uh, I, I mean, I think, you know, when it, uh, let's, let's, let's take an issue like contraception, um, a little less contested among Catholics than um, something like right. gay marriage or women priests. Uh, I think most Catholics, the vast majority of Catholics, you know, they know what the church teaches and they've come to a kind of internal agreement that uh, that is not as important to them as the Eucharist. I would imagine that that's the kind of model of thinking that most Cat that that most Catholics who have serious problems with certain elements of the of the teaching, um, I think I think that's the kind of thought pattern that they would employ uh, in order to you know avoid tearing their hair out at church. Right, but that seems to be a more um, personal decision you know, that you've decided that you're still going to go to church and you're still going to use contraception, um, as opposed to feeling, believing that it's an injustice that gay people can't be married mm -hmm. and you're not gay, but you, you know, so it's sure. not like you can do anything like, you know, like with the contraception example, you can ignore mm -hmm. the church teaching on, con uh, on contraception. But it's almost as if with this other issue, you can't ignore it if you feel like it's an injustice. No, I mean, if this, yeah, obviously, um, if you're in a diocese, and, and, and a lot of this is very personal. I mean, like like politics, religion is very personal. If you have a pastor who's going to um, preach regularly uh, um, on an issue in a way that you find violates your, you know, your, some of your most closely held beliefs, then yeah, I mean, you're probably going to walk out. You're, you're probably, you're, or you might find a parish that, 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 that attends to your spiritual needs in a way that doesn't offend your moral sensibilities. But is there a parish and with, is there a parish in America where, um, the priest could be in favor, could be publicly in favor of same sex marriage? Is that even possible? No, maybe you're not. Uh, no, probably not. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, I mean, even if he was in his heart, he could not publicly. I'm sure that, yeah, I mean, I'm sure there are priests who, who disagree with, I mean, because it, if it finally is a, a, there's a, there's a question of public policy here. Um, it's not, I mean, there may be, I'm sure there are a lot of Catholics who think that, uh, I mean, if, if you look at the polling numbers, it's, they're right there with the rest of the country. Um, they you know, in some, by some majority, they support same sex marriage. Um, mm -hmm. but I bet you, if you pulled those same Catholics, uh, very high numbers of them would still, would still maintain that the church should not have to bless those kinds of unions. Sure. But it's sort of just like a civil, um, legal, but not, but from the church, point of view, it wouldn't be a sacramental, right. uh, Union. So, uh, and I, I, so, I mean, I may think that's the kind of, you know, when you, when you drill down into the public policy questions, um, it's not as the, but the, sorry. But those exemptions for, you know, churches are written into most of the same sex marriage laws that are being passed in state legislatures. Right. They, they say, you know, no church or religious institution will be forced to recognize or perform a same sex Sure. Ceremony. I mean, you can. It yeah, I don't think it's totally irrational for church leaders to have serious concerns about the ramifications for their own practice uh, when it comes to, um, you know, lo laws that are passed that could be construed by courts as human rights. Um, you know, once something gets you know elevated to that level, um, then you know, how is that going to be adjudicated when it comes to, you know, renting 
renting the parish hall, that that sort of thing. Um, you know, I, I, I seriously, you know, I, I don't know any priests who are seriously concerned that they will be forced by the state to bless same-sex marriages. But I do right. know priests who who wonder how this is going to play out over time. Um, but that's still, you know, it's the the, the question of whether the state should sanction same-sex unions, I think for a lot of Catholics is, is separate from what the church teaches about marriage, which is not, the church teaches a lot of right, things about the, marriage. Right, but the, the church the, does. The church doesn't just does. teach that marriage is, is woman plus man. I mean, that, that's not the only thing the church teaches about, about marriage. There's actually a very right. long tradition and, and beautiful tradition um, of, of teachings on marriage. And I think that's probably where most Catholics, uh, you know, go when they in in their in their minds when they when they think about what the church has to say about marriage the problem is right that, but the yeah you know you, the you, church has injected itself into the public policy debate and not just the right and intra-religious debate right but you know that's yeah. um which is their right and and uh and and that's something that you know that the church encourages catholics to be active in in, in public right. policy debates but do you think the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops has a um, – in terms of its lobbying arm in Washington, do you think that it has an outsized – or maybe that's not the, wrong, the right word – but that the lobbying it does in Washington is not necessarily representative of the views – I and mean, people hire a lobbyist to, to, to argue their case – to legislators, right? Um, and it's not like Catholics have signed on to like, yes, yeah, I want the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops to lobby on X, Y, and Z for me in Washington. I mean, it doesn't work that way. The bishops decide what they're going to lobby on. And do you think it's representative of the variety of, of American Catholic thought on on the various issues that the, that, that the bishops lobby on, which are not I should point out, limited to the things that make no. the news a lot. I mean, I think they come, you know, I don't think they actually have actual lobbyists. They have staff members who go to the Hill and, and make the pitch. I don't think they have any registered lobbyists who they hire. They don't have to, though. The, the Lobbying Disclosure Act exempts right. them. So, um, so um, you know, I I actually think they they, they do, you know, they, they do cover a pretty broad spectrum. You saw with the... Um, that series of letters that the the, the bishops released um, to the, the house, uh, strongly critiquing the, the the most recent version of the Paul Ryan budget as yeah. you know failing a moral test for uh, protecting the most vulnerable. Um, you know that that arm of the bishops' conference is pretty robust, um, and they're not you know they're. Uh, they don't necessarily have a lot of contact with the pro-life office, which seems to be very heavily involved in the religious freedom campaign. Um, right. I don't know. I don't know how the staffing stacks up. I mean, I know that the religious freedom committee um, has staffed up. I know that uh, at the most recent bishops conference meeting, they voted to approve an increase in the diocesan tax, which is in part how the Bishops' Conference is, is funded by a tax that's levied against each diocese in order to fund this these hires. Um, so, I mean, it would be, yeah, uh, the, the question here is emphasis, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, when Commonweal criticized the way that the bishops are, are handling the religious freedom campaign, it, it was about perception you know how how are people going to view our our people our, our catholics are non catholics going to view you bishops as partisans now i think mm -hmm. you know i think that these recent letters you know the the kinds of the, it doesn't use the same kind of language that you would see in economic justice for all which was a, the us bishops pastoral letter on the economy uh which i believe came up 25 years ago i might i might have that wrong mm -hmm. um and that was a very strong critique of unfettered capitalism, uh, the kind of capitalism that ignores the poor. You know, you're, mm -hmm. you're not seeing as strong uh, of, of language in these in this most recent series of letters, but it mm -hmm. still is a series of letters, and the bishops have, have issued a series these of... These are the letters that they sent to the congressional committees that's about right. the Paul Ryan budget. That's right. Um, mm -hmm. And that's... Uh, 
it's still relatively strong language. Um, it's stronger language than you saw surrounding the Iraq war, uh, for sure. Even, the, I mean, you, we, it, it was, it was, uh, it was Rome that was doing more lobbying against that war, uh, than mm -hmm. the U S bishops. Um, so, you know, and I, I wonder, you know, I wonder what the, 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 these, these are separate committees. Um, so you have to imagine that, um, the, the committee that issued these letters on the Ryan budget, you know, they, maybe they recognized, uh, that the religious freedom campaign was, was sucking all the air out of the room and, the, mm -hmm. and they wanted to shift the conversation a little bit, or at least to say, yeah. look, you know, we bishops are not Republicans. We're not Democrats there. We don't have a party. We have a range of issues that not, that no single party addresses, whether it's the death penalty, whether it's poverty, whether it's abortion, whether it's same sex marriage. Mm -hmm. Do you think that uh, this is this sort of discussion about the budget issues? I mean, the way that Ryan played that, you know, when he told, uh, and he, he, he brought this up last year when his budget was, you know, before it was passed by the House, when he was first proposed, not first proposed, but when it was in the news last year, last spring. Right. But then he went into some more detail. I can't remember who he gave the interview in, in 2011 when he talked about it, but then he went into more detail with David Brody at the yes. Christian Broadcasting Network where he talked about um, that it was in line with the preferential option for the poor and the Catholic right. concept of subsidiarity. Yes, that was hilarious. Uh, and, that was totally absurd. Which is, was you know, not... Absurd. Right, but where did he... You know, it's, it's a, he did not pull that out of the air, I don't think. I mean, there are... Sure. Catholic thinkers or think tanks, maybe is a better way to put it, who have been spinning it that way, have been have been uh, lining themselves up with the sort of small government conservatives and turning this Catholic idea of subsidiarity into a ar an argument for why the government for federalism. Needs to be. I believe is what Paul writes. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. it's right. it's a tricky teaching. I mean, it's kind of can work as a Rorschach test. Um, and it's been used by laissez-faire economists to justify, um, you know, all manner of unfettered capitalism, uh, which, you know, is not something you're going to find a lot of support for in uh, church teaching, especially in papal teaching. Um, but, uh, you know, it's just, Paul Ryan sounds like he's, he's you know, grafting kind of Ayn Randian vision onto Catholic teaching, um, and then when, and, and, and maybe if you could just give a little as short as you oh, can sure. description yeah, I mean, of what subsidiarity is. It's the idea that the smallest unit in society should be ha helping at the community level. It's not just the sm maybe it's, I it's not, ju it's not <laughs> just the most local level that should govern. It's the most local. Mm -hmm. It's it's the most local level that can govern best. Mm -hmm. So. You know, you would see this argument trotted out by people who are opposed to the Affordable Care Act because, you know, there was a fig there was you know the fairy tale that was being told that this, this was a government takeover um, and that right. this violates Catholic teaching because the Catholic Church teaches that it's the low it's the the, the, the most local level that's for your well that's not that's right not so the, the federal teaching. government shouldn't be doing it right and and the, it's 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 the teaching of you know it, the, the the teaching would hold that if the most local level has failed then you got to move up the chain. But, and, and it can never be held apart from solidarity. So it's not just, you know, it's not just this teaching about how the governing or wh at what level the governing should, should take place. It's also about, you know, who are you in solidarity with? And for Christians, that's the poor. Right. Well, so, uh, you know, you said that it was like Paul Ryan was engrafting um, Catholic teaching on, uh, engrafting Ayn, Ayn Rand on Catholic teaching. And I felt like it was, he was grafting it with Grover Norquist. It kind of, it was like he was trying to give the justification for drowning government in the bathtub, you know, making right. it so small that you can drown in the bathtub and trying to give some Catholic justification for that, which seemed. No, yeah. and, and, you know, and I, I, I wouldn't argue with that. Uh, and I, I also think. It was fascinating to see, um, you know, he, he rolls this, uh, this argument, uh, this interview out with um, David Brody. And, you know, then this series of letters from the Bishop's Conference come, comes out 
And then Ryan gives another interview where he tries to minimize those statements as, you know, coming from, you know, not, you know, it's, this is just from a few, a few bishops. Just a committee. <laughs> Right. I mean, that's not really how the Bishop's Conference works. I mean, you can see that the, the temptation, it's, it's, it, it's one that I think both liberal Catholics and conservative Catholics fall victim to. Uh, you know, you don't want to believe that, that uh, you know, your ox is being gored by every single bishop. And it's not, it's, not, it's not entirely false that, you know, there are bishops who would agree with Ryan's budget. Um, but it is false to claim that the bishops who wrote those letters do not represent the the, the, the the wider body of bishops because they are in fact elected to serve in those mm -hmm. roles to represent mm -hmm. the entire body of bishops. Well, um, maybe that's a good place to end. Uh, <laughs> Democracy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, this was really fascinating to talk with yeah, you about thanks. all of this. Thank you very much. Anytime. Okay, bye. bye.